This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living Catholic, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor of Sacred Heart Parish and rector of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother. Lying is much in the news these days. Well, to be more specific, it pops up as an aspect of journalistic interest. It would take too long to do an expose of the history of lying in the major media, but it would be safe to say that journalism and not telling the truth have the same general history. Journalism is, after all, a human activity, and there's nothing more human than dissimulation, confabulation, duplicity, mendacity, insincerity, and deceit. Telling lies seems to be at the center of what we do. So it's important important to note this since we tend to imagine our situation in our time is unique to us. And it's true, the specific instance that causes our attention can be turned to concerns about truthfulness and falsity that are tied to what's going on in our world amid our politics. Even a brief perusal of the headlines is enough to spark awareness of how common it is to share what is false and fabulated and how destructive the consequences really are. But it really has been so in every age. William Manchester reminded everyone in his book, Not So Wild a Dream, that one of the issues of the presidential election season of 1960 was whether Richard Nixon had told the strict truth about where his wife had gotten a fur coat and whether she wore it very often. Two years after that, after the election, the president would have to make the decisions to keep the U.S. from a major nuclear war with the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile, Missile Crisis, which would have cost something like 60 million lives. It's hard to believe the contest to elect the president would devolve into questions about a coat worn once. But so these things go. We must remember our age these days is not unique. It's merely our age. And in our age, we encounter the truth of human life and can never escape its inevitabilities. And lying is one of those aspects of our human experience. It goes back to the beginning. We might complain that the plague of falsity has infected our society, but we have to acknowledge that all we have to do is open the scriptures to see this aspect of our lives described beginning on page three. In a remarkably intricate and sophisticated way, we have a description of Adam who refrained from telling God the whole truth in the Garden of Eden. Well, to be honest, of course, the phenomenon begins with the serpent who speaks to Eve about the prohibition of eating the forbidden fruit. She informs the serpent that they are not to eat it or even to touch it lest they die. And as a hundred commentators have noted, she exaggerated the prohibition that had been delivered to them and so opened the way for the serpent's ability to twist her words and deliver his contorted message to her. So we should pause for a minute to note, we all recognize this story for what it is, a story. Those in the meeting would, uh, so we recognize it as a story. No one has to believe that there was a moment in the past in which the first man and the first woman were standing around in the garden listening to a snake talk to them. Just because the story is not a newspaper description of an event that took place at a particular moment, it doesn't lessen its insight and its impact or its truth, and we all know it. I'll give you an example. When I was in Duncan, one of my parishioners told me of his work at Halliburton and the different challenges that he faced there, including the decision-making process at the company there. He said that often they would come out of a meeting and someone would have posted the cartoon Dilbert from that day's newspaper on the bulletin board. Those in the meeting would stop, read it, and laugh because the cartoon detailed exactly what had gone on at that meeting, down to the things that were actually said by the people around the table. Now, the man who wrote the cartoon, Scott Adams, wasn't in the meeting and didn't know what the management was going to talk about that day. In fact, he wouldn't have known anything at at the meeting at all. He just made the cartoon up out of thin air. It was all a product of his imagination. But it was true nonetheless, because it described a true event and the true dynamics of big company decision-making. There is no Dilbert, no Dogbert, no Wally. They're all characters that inhabit only the universe of the cartoon space. But what they say and how they act 
are true to human experience. We take a look at the cartoon and laugh because it describes the foolishness of our experience almost exactly. We act in the same way those characters make fun of, and we know it, which is why we keep laughing at them, and on and on. We grimace at Lady Macbeth's bloodthirsty desires, although there was never any such person. We're anxious about the Reverend Dimsdale's relationship with, to his people when the truth of Hester Prynne is known to everyone, although these people never existed. We even speculate about Harry Potter's future when he comes into conflict with Professor Dumbledore, even though there is no Hogwarts, no school of wizardry, and no Voldemort. And yet each of these characters exist in our imagination because they bear a truth of an aspect of our humanity that we know and value. The more we follow the pathway of their experience and the content of their insights, the more we know about the possibility of our own lives and the power of our own decisions. So let's not allow the story form of Genesis to distract us from the truth of the revelation there. God is perfectly capable of conveying the truth of revelation through the enormously powerful content of the characters of the opening pages of the Bible, even though, even if, they are the product of imaginative representation. So, back to the story. As the serpent as the serpent talks to Eve, she begins to respond. The serpent's message isn't untrue exactly, it's just incomplete. And that's the first thing to notice about lying. There's more to it than simply saying what's not true. As children, we're always taught to tell the truth even when it hurts and when we're tempted to tell lies. We imagine then as, as long as we don't tell an outright lie, we've covered the basis. Telling the truth means not telling a lie, which isn't a bad lesson when you're eight years old. But as a lesson, it only lasts until you're about eight and a half. Then you find out there's more to the challenge of the truth than simply being able to affirm whether something you say is true speech or not. In the example of Adam and Eve, the twisted speech of the serpent leads to Eve adopting a false view of the question of whether to reach for and then to eat the fruit. As she does, as she does decide to eat it, Adam decides to eat it as well. And as they do, their eyes are opened and they see the results of their decision. They're ashamed. And in their shame, they go and hide in the shade of the trees. Now, according to the story, in a delightful image, God comes walking through the garden in the cool breezes of the evening and doesn't spot Adam. He then calls out to him. Adam responds by explaining that he and Eve are hiding because they're naked. And God then asks, well, who told you you were naked? And from that, God draws the conclusion that they had eaten from the forbidden fruit. Adam's response was truthful. He was naked, but it was an incomplete of response. He violated what God had told him to do. And Adam's speech, therefore, was a succession of blanks, and God had to fill in what was left out in order to get to the true sp perspective of what had taken place. So it's possible that true facts are spoken, but they're not the truth of what has happened or what has taken place. It was that way with Adam. In fact, in much of the rest of the scriptures, there's a tension between that which a person can comfortably say and acknowledge and that which is the truth of the situation. Coming to know the truth is part of the struggle of coming to know God and to know God at work in the world. That's much of the themes of the prophets. Their message isn't to look into a crystal ball and pick up the details of what's going to happen a year or a decade into the future. Their challenge is to look and to see what's actually there, what's really happening, and then disclose the truth of things. The prophetic struggle is to get people to see the truth. Of course, this struggle is one that we're all involved in. What's true and what we know of it is the product of real work. Truth doesn't fall out of the sky and land upon our heads. Usually, it's only after struggling to have the truth, the tools to understand and appreciate what we're seeing that we can see the truth. Think of a particle physicist and all he has to learn in order to appreciate what he's seeing when he looks at the experimental data in his lab or when he reads scientific articles. Unless he spent years of serious work developing tools for understanding, what he sees in front of him is just a welter of figures and jargon, none of it making much sense to him. So knowing the truth isn't easy. It comes only after a serious investment of a life dedicated to it. Or to take a more local case, 
what, for example, is the cause of the homeless situation we see in our city? 20 years ago, people were not huddled under tents in thickets and under bridges. You didn't see people asleep on sidewalks in the middle of the day, nor were there people dragging suitcases and grocery carts and, and mattresses behind them along the streets. Now, those are everyday sites. What happened? Where do they come from? How many of them are incapable of living in more conventional ways? Is a conventional arrangement of a house or an apartment or a room something beyond them? And knowing the answers to these questions, what are we to do? Is there anything that, could be, that can be done? Or is the response beyond us? Now, I don't know the answer to any of those questions. The truth of those scratching out a place on the open spots of public life here in the city is hidden to me. To find the answers will take a lot of work and a lot of discernment, since I don't know who has any explanations that are adequate to the situation or who has an understanding adequate to the facts I know. I don't know what to do because I don't know the answer. I don't know the truth of the matter. The best I can say is that I have to do my best to keep people from starving and freezing or being victimized. Of the rest, I am ignorant. Truth doesn't just fall out of the sky. Often it hides amidst the complications of life. And it also hides among those who are comfortable distorting the truth. Not everyone who speaks for these homeless speaks the truth or even knows the truth. It's the same with any reality. We have to work at finding out, at paying attention to what's important. Rather than simply finding an answer because it's convenient or congenial, we have to work at it. Over and over, the prophets command the leaders of Israel to pay attention to what's happening in society, especially what's happening to the people on the bottom. To this extent, they are as likely to write about the price of barley and the cost of firewood as they are to talk about law and prayer. Unless you pay attention to the poor, they say, you'll have missed the point of your leadership. It's the message of truth, of truth for their leadership and for all leadership everywhere. Of course, telling these truths is only half of it. The meaning of their prophetic point of view has to be heard and then acted on. The suffering of the prophet is usually guaranteed because the truth is often denied and, after denial, resisted. A phrase that has been cited over and over, attributed variously to Stalin, Goering, Hitler, Mussolini, and Richard Nixon, is this, quote, when I hear someone say the truth, unquote, I reach for my pistol. This is the much repeated trope that the truth simply depends on who's in charge. That's one of the temptations we all face, shaving our appreciation of what we know to be true based on the prevailing fashion for the truth. The long history of giving into this temptation touches medicine and education and religion and the military and personal relationships, as well as just about every other aspect of humanity. People have been willing to substitute the truth for falsity in just about every measure based on expedience and convenience. But we also know we have a hunger for what is true, and it bubbles up within us. When things don't work or when they're at cross purposes or they don't, they just seem not to be right, we want to know why and how. This seems to be written into our capacities at some level of our awareness, and we are fully satisfied only when we taste it. After all, one of the transcendent virtues is the true. That is, there is a recognition in us that when we encounter the world, there is a congruence possible with what we know and experience. When we find, when what we find is in line with, and is in line with, that is, going along with the life of the world, we know it to be true. When contrary to the life of the world written in us, it's not true. This sentiment extends past questions of the veracity of a statement of fact. It includes the sum of our capacities to encounter the world and to encounter our place in it. If you've ever entered a well-proportioned building, you know there's a kind of truth to it, absent from it if it's not well-designed. A relationship of selfless trust and openness bears truth with it. A pattern of life resulting in good health and prospering contentment is a truly beautiful life, and on and on. This congruence with what is and what carries the potential for being is the experience of what is good and true in our lives. That's the truth we hunger for. There's another aspect of the challenge of the truth as well. 
which is this. Telling the truth is not enough. That may come as a surprise to many of us who are challenged when we try to tell the truth. We've all had many temptations to shave the truth and tell less than we know. So doing this even minimum thing is is difficult. It's hard to live in the truth and to tell the truth. But acting on the truth is even more difficult. But if we don't act, however, if we're content to know the truth but do nothing to live the truth, then we contribute to falsehood. That might sound like a kind of technical aspect of the question. We know there is a power to lying that's a lot bigger than those who are content not to tell the truth. There is an aspect to lying that has the power to distort everything it touches. As part of the distortion, every word, every decision, every person's life, and every aspect of society is affected. What can result is a nightmare. Václav Havel was famous for pointing out this aspect of the world when he described the power of the Soviet state. He used the example of the grocer who's told to put a sign in his window affirming the Marxist slogan of, Workers of the World Unite. The grocer knows this slogan is empty and meaningless because the Soviet state did nothing to help workers of the world and created an economic system that impoverished and disempowered everything it touched. And the grocer, he knew this in every way it could be known. The truth was also known to the communist officials who tell him to place the slogan in his window. They know it's empty and represents falsehood on every level. In fact, they know its emptiness so thoroughly that they know the grocer knows it. And they know that all the people who pass by and read it in the window will also know its faults in every way. But they don't care about its emptiness or its falsity or its destructive history. They only care that it's in the grocer's window. Thus, the system that subverted nations, immiserated a continent, and helped to contribute to the murder of millions is thereby tolerated and sustained. It's not just a matter of whether someone says something false. It's a matter of the lack of truth taking on the power to destroy. In Havel's view, the only thing to do is to act out the truth. The grocer has to refuse to put the sign in the window because he knows it represents what is not true. It'll be impossible to make the true true until he's willing to act it out in truth. It's not enough to go home and complain about the state that continues to propose this foolish slogan as a way to justify its existence. He can't just say what's true and say it's foolish. He has to act. The horrific history of the Soviet Union and the wake of the destroyed lives it left behind, that's testimony enough to the power of lying and its potential to dissolve our humanity. In its 70 years of lying, the Soviet Union managed not only to facilitate the murder of millions, but to gain the support of the most sympathetic people in the world who were convinced that the Union stood for compassion and tolerance. The observation of the Polish philosopher Leszek Kolkowski about the capacity for lying in the Soviet Union describes it well. He wrote, quote, There is no reliable criterion of truth apart from what is the declared truth of the moment. Thus, the lie becomes the truth, or at any rate, the distinction between truth and lies in the ordinary sense of these words disappears. This is the great triumph of socialism in the sphere of knowledge. To the extent that it succeeds in demolishing the notion of truth, it cannot be accused of lying, unquote. Choosing not to act out the truth is to end up at a place and time in which the truth will not be capable of being known. This is the first, this is first approach to the dynamics that we have observed all around us. It is the outcome reached when we become suspicious that no one is telling the truth. If we come to believe there is no place where truth is being spoken and lived, then we presume everything to be false or the product of someone lying to us. The corollary is that everyone's words are the product of their commitment to advance their interests rather than to describe what they know to be true. If we reach this place, then it becomes impossible for the truth to be told. More accurately, it becomes impossible for the truth to be heard. Because if everyone presumes every expression is a lie, then even if the truth is shouted from the rooftops, no one will believe it. 
The historian John Lukash observed that in the Weimar Republic in Germany between World War I and World War II, everyone had to come had come to the presumption that all journalists, no matter who they were, lied to them. Everything published in the newspaper was simply false or distorted or skewed. And not because of the limitations of journalists to get the whole story all at once, or because newspapermen weren't skilled at uncovering the information they needed. No, but it was because these journalists wanted to hurt their opponents and weaken their enemies more than anything else. Promoting those things they knew not to be true was what journalism existed for at this time. So in that environment, a journalist uncovered the plans of the Nazis for their control of the country and their elimination of the Jews. His paper thereby published everything they could find of the documents and agenda of the Nazi party. But because of the presumption that all journalists lied all the time, nobody paid attention. When lying is presumed, the truth may not be able to be told, which leads to an additional aspect of truth-telling. It is possible to create an alternative reality based on fundamentally false foundations in which everything is so distorted and so warped that nothing of the truth can escape. This is a kind of black hole in which the gravitational power of the opposite of truth doesn't allow any element of truth to escape. In the distortions that result from such forces, almost anything can happen. Some commentators have described such things as not even false in the sense that calling them false, as in not being true, doesn't even get close to describing what they are. They are untruth in every sense, an inversion of truth so profoundly false in every way that nothing of them has a hint of truth in it. At least the devil could distort the truth in order to tempt Eve and have her decide to reach for the apple. In the realm of untruth, the power of falsity would, falsity would make it possible for Eve to mistake even the chance that the apple was an apple and her choice was a choice. The power of lying seems almost unlimited. We only have to look around briefly at our own society to note that we compete with untruth every day in sexuality and social conditioning, in the appreciation of life and its point, in the value of our bodies and our body's parts and purpose in our place in nature, in the goals for living and being, in how we treat one another. We're competing not just with falsity, but with the opposite of truth in each one of these categories. The stakes are high. Truth-telling is a challenge vastly greater than the temptation to fib or exaggerate. It is the invitation to cooperate in the building of the world in the pattern of God's work. Because the source of the world is God, and the power of truth is to represent God in the world. And nothing is more challenging and more powerful than that. Back in just a moment. final segment, Faith in Verse, we have a poem today called At the Table. We sit at our tables, the chairs gathered round, hungry to satisfy the craving that makes us sound, and talk and watch and listen to one another as we can, until we are filled or at least sustained in the human plan. This gathering, in short, is what we note and what we need. Our table nourishment is our breath, our blood, our feed. Unless we forget our health and forego our sustaining until the foundational energies seize or maintaining, and we, although bumping into tables everywhere, we choose to leave empty all the near chairs, to starve before we know it, hungry always, wandering about the world to fill ourselves other ways, and begin to eat clumsily, remaining standing, our hunger not to be denied, ever demanding. Until we spot our place, not only waiting there, but as empty as our lives, as coal and bare. Our meals are not simply ballast and cud, but are the heart of ourselves, our lifeblood. That's at the table. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit okcr.org.